Okay. Um, if you noticed in chapter one, there was a section that we didn't cover, and the section is called performance analysis and measurement. And so we're going through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and now we're going to take a backwards trip and, and look at performance analysis and measurement. The reason for that was to understand something about uh, what makes software fast and slow and what makes machines fast and slow before we come to this section. So this won't be, I don't think, too challenging, but it will be analytical and numeric. Okay? So uh, performance of computers um, can be measured, can be reported, and can be summarized. In order to get good performance, you have to make intelligent choices. In order to purchase good performance, you have to see through the marketing hype. Does everybody know what hype is? Sort of, you know, say propaganda, the things that the marketing people will try to tell you. They, they hype it up. They make it sound like it's great. But you've got to get through that and get to the real numbers. So what I hope to do in this next uh, week is to help you get ready to give intelligent advice to your company about what to purchase and how to spend their money and what's valuable and what's not. And so uh, this will be key to understanding uh, the underlying organizational motivation of a computer. And how are they organized? Well, they're organized for performance. So this section will help us to understand what things cause performance. We'll be able, to, when, after this section is done, to answer the question, uh, why is some hardware better than others uh, for different programs? We'll be able to answer the question, what <coughs> factors of system performance are hardware related? And what factors are software related? What factors are other related? In other words, do we need a new machine? Or we do we need a new operating system? Or do we need a new language? Or do we need to not write a new program? So we'll look at, at some of those issues. And we'll also begin to understand how does the machine's instruction set affect performance. You know, we've been talking about instruction set architecture, but we haven't connected that category of design with performance. So I did, I've got an ISA. Is it going to give me fast or give me slow performance? We're going to look at that as well. So these are some of the topics that we're going to be looking in. Let's start with an analogy. Let's start with an airplane. We were talking about going outside Turkey to do a stage somewhere else. So let's uh, continue that discussion. And let's look at four different airplane models. A Boeing 777, a Boeing 747, uh, a British Air Corporation Sud Concord, which now is grounded. As you know, the Concords are out of flight. And Douglas DC-8, classic um, old style, much smaller plane. You can see that each plane has a passenger capacity from the 747s, which are intercontinental, transocean, uh, large ones, nearly 500 people, down to the smaller ones. The Concorde is also, but of course it, it uh, had a weight limit, so it had very small. And then this DC-8 is, is a non-transcontinental. Ranges are different. Notice the ranges are related to weight, long distance for low weights, much shorter distance for heavier weights. Speeds are also different. The Concorde, of course, being a supersonic plane, the others being subsonic, in the order of just below the sound barrier. Just all these miles per hour, just below the, the speed of sound, so that they don't break the sound barrier. Now, if you look at those three different uh, measurement characteristics for these four different uh, airplanes, you could start to say, well, how much faster is the Concorde compared to the 747? Well, that's talking about speed. So how much faster is the Concord than the 747? Well, you could subtract these two, but that would say, oh, you know, 740 miles per hour different in speed. And that might not tell the full story, because if one goes zero miles per hour and one goes 740, that's quite a different story than if one goes 7,000 and one goes 7,740. In other words, it's the, the FARC in absolute difference isn't what we're interested in. The ratio would be much better. And you could say that the Concorde goes more than twice as fast. In other words, how much faster is it? More than two to one by having a ratio of Concorde speed divided by 747 speed. How much bigger is the 747 than the Douglas DC-8? Well, bigger if that means passenger. 747 and DC-8, you could subtract again. But I think it's more relevant to say, well, it's three times, more than three times, almost three and a half times as big. Again, the ratio of 470 over 146 would be a more meaningful number. So when we talk about these kind of performances in airplanes, ratios seem to be more relevant than actual subtracted differences. Which airplane moves the most passengers in the least time? Well, that's not given here. Passengers is given, speed is given, but passengers per hour or something like that is not given. We'd have to make some calculations between passengers and speed in order to come up with numbers, and then we'd have to again uh, rank them. So that number is not even directly given, but we could uh, make some estimates of that. What's the point of that? The point of that is performance metrics may vary. The question you're asking may give a different answer about which one's best. Interested in speed, interested in passenger capacity. The last question is asking about what we call throughput. 
passengers per unit of time. Or how quick can I move them from one airport to another and get them off so I can use my plane again? Because once you filled your plane, you can't get any more money out of those people. You've got to get them off and get some more people on. So throughput would be something airlines are interested in. In fact, they're less interested in this and even less interested in this than in this because this is how they make their money. Passengers per unit of time. Passengers are interested in this. How quick can I get there? That's why people paid a lot of money to fly on the supersonic Concorde. Passengers might be interested in this. Uh, how big or little is the plane? Airlines are beginning to get interested in this. This is a factor, and this is a factor too, but this is the one that's their money factor, throughput. All right, so let's look at for computers now. We're not in airline or aeronautic uh, in in engineering. We're in computer engineering. So from a purchasing perspective, what kind of questions are uh, relevant? Well, given that there's a set of machines that you could choose among, which has the best performance? Which has the least cost? Which has the best cost per performance? See, the best performance would probably be the most expensive, and the lowest cost would probably be have the lowest performance, but really the issue is, if I'm going to spend $10,000 or $100,000, how do I get the most performance for the least cost? That's what I'm really interested in, okay? because it's performance I need to get my job done, but it's cost that I have to think about because that's my budget. Okay? So actually, this is more relevant than either of these individually in terms of purchasing. How about from a design perspective? We're computer engineers. We also design computers. And so our question with design options, given, oh, I could do this, or we could do this, or we could do it this way, are things like, which one leads to the best performance improvement from what I have now? Which one costs the least from what I have now? Which one gives the best cost performance ratio, or performance per cost ratio? Again, look at that. Very interesting. Individual questions can be asked, but more relevant is, Bang for the buck, we say in English. Bang, that's impact for the buck. That's the cost. Impact for the cost. That's really the issue. And actually, that's what we've got to be looking at. Um, now, both of these, both purchasing perspective and design perspective, require a basis for comparison. How can I compare them? What's the thing that I'm going to be looking for? And a metric for evaluating. I've got to measure so that I say, how much of this basis did I get for this one or for that one? And our goal in this section is going to be to understand what factors in the architecture of computer systems contribute to the overall system performance and the relative importance and relative costs of these factors. Okay, that's going to be where we're headed for. Now let's start by looking at some computer performance measures. The first and most obvious one is the response time. How long does it take for my job to run? How long is it from the time I start the thing until the thing is done? My one job. How long does it take to execute an average job? How long must I wait for a database query to happen? How long must I wait from the time I push the go button till the time I get the web page or get the money out of the ATM or whatever? And this is called response time. It's about how long is the duration. Now, another perspective, which I mentioned to you, the airlines are very concerned about, and obviously people running computer systems that have many jobs are worried about, and that's called throughput. How many jobs can I get done on this machine um, at the same time. What's the average execution rate? That means how many jobs are working now or how many jobs are finishing per unit of time? How much work is getting done? This is a th big perspective on the machine as a multi-job system. This is just looking at one individual job. This is a user perspective. This is an owner or operator perspective. Now, if we upgrade a machine with a new processor, what do we increase? Do we increase the response time or decrease the response time? Do we increase the throughput? Do we decrease the throughput? And if we add a new machine to a lab which has 20 and now we put in number 21, do we improve the response time? Do we improve the throughput? Let's think about that for just a minute. I have one machine and I put in a better processor. So now the machine runs faster. Is that going to cause me to have a lower response time? Yeah, I, I say let's go surf the net or let's go calculate this. Is it going to work faster for me? Yeah, so we're going to get a better response time for one individual job. Okay, now, the machine runs faster, so now let's think about how many jobs that machine can do in a day. After I've done my job, you step up and do yours. After you do yours, you step up. So in a day, will the number of jobs that machine does, will the throughput of that machine increase because it has a better processor? Yes, it will, because each job is shorter, so we'll get more done in a period of time. So the first question here, if we upgrade a machine with a new processor, we both decrease latency and increase throughput. 
Now let's ask a different question. You go to a lab, and the lab used to have 20 computers, and now the lab has 21 computers. Can that lab, because of the new machine, get more jobs done in a day? Yeah, can, more students can sit down, do their job, and get up. So we increase the throughput of the lab by adding uh, not faster processing, but additional processing. Now let's ask the question about response time. The response time is the time for one job. You've got a job you want to do, you come to a computer lab, you sit down at a machine, and you pick one out of the 20 and you do your job, or you pick one out of the 21 and do your job. Is there any difference in response time? Because all the machines in the lab have the same processor, so the response time didn't speed up, unless you come to the lab and they're all full, and you have to wait. And then when you sit down, your job takes a certain amount of time. So you have wait time plus job time. Did adding a new computer to that lab decrease the latency? Yeah, because it decreased the wait time. On average, a lab with 21 computers will serve you faster than a lab with 20, won't it? Certainly a lab with 40 computers will serve you much faster. You'll probably not have to wait at all, unless it's a very popular lab. So actually, we didn't decrease the time to do the job, but we increased the total time, including the wait time in the queue. All right, now let's look at execution time. Okay, the, the ex elapsed time and CPU time and user CPU time are three different ways to measure time. Elapsed time counts everything, from the time you start your job until the time your job ends. Includes the time that your job actually runs on the CPU, time to access disk and memory, time to do I.O., everything. Including the fact that the operating system on that may be doing other jobs in parallel with yours. So yours runs a while, then it stops, somebody else's runs, yours runs some more. So the total elapsed time. That's a useful number, but it's often not good for comparison because it isn't just for your job and it isn't just about running code. It's also about the whole system design. How about CPU time? CPU time doesn't count I.O. or time spent anybody else running anybody else's programs. Uh, it can be broken up into system time running on the CPU in support of your job. You called a read, you, did, you, know, you, you had the CPU run some functions, I mean the operating system, and your actual code. So this is your code, and this is the code you called from the uh, operating system or the library. That's the CPU time, doesn't count these other factors. And then user CPU time just takes this and doesn't even include system calls. It's actually the code you wrote, not the code you called which somebody else wrote, okay? And our focus is going to be on user CPU time as the measurement of how long a program takes to run. It's the time spent executing the lines of code that are in our program as opposed to called by our program out of a library or out of a system. Okay, so that's going to be the, the one that we look at. But this time is useful, and this time is useful, but this time is the most specific to a particular job. Now, the book's definition of performance is for some program running on machine X, the performance of X is 1 over the operating, the execution time of X, and that would be CPU time of X. So if the time is smaller, the performance will get bigger. Really little execution times mean really big performance. You got it? Performance big means that's great. It performed well. It's a high performance program. And performance small comes from big execution times. As this gets smaller because it's an inverse, that's going to get bigger. X is n times faster than Y simply means the performance of X is n times greater than the performance of Y. The ratio of those two performances is n. <coughs> Makes sense? If my performance is twice as fast as yours, then it's because our ratio is 2. And of course, that means that my time is going to be half of yours. Everybody see that? If, if the performance ratios are x over y equals n, then the time ratios are going to be time y divided by time x equals n. In other words, your time is going to be bigger, therefore my performance is bigger. Your time is uh, related to your performance, which makes it low. My time is low, which makes my performance high. All right, so here's a little problem. Machine A runs a program in 20 seconds. Machine B runs the same program in 25 seconds. How much faster is A than B? Well, performance of A is 1 over 20. Performance of B is 1 over 25. And 1 over 20 divided by 1 over 25 is 25 over 20. Okay? So the performance of A is greater because its time is less. Okay? It's not 20 over 25. A is 0.8 times as fast as B. No. A is 
1.25 times as fast as B. Okay. Now, as I said before, we want to uh, distinguish between the elapsed time, the total time spent, and the time actually spent on our task. And the CPU execution time, um, which is called CPU time, minus the time the CPU spends working on a task. Okay? Uh, no, not minus. CPU execution time is the time the CPU spends on a task. It doesn't include waiting for I.O. or running anybody else's other programs. So CPU execution time for a program is CPU, number of CPU clock cycles for a program multiplied by the clock cycle time. Got it? This is how many cycles. This is the time for each cycle. So that's how many. This is how many. That's the time. You multiply them together, you get a time. Or you could think of it this way. CPU clock cycles for a program, same as this, divided by the clock rate because the clock cycle time is one over the clock rate. Everybody remember that? Hey, could you guys close your books and just pay attention and turn off your computers and put your cell phones away and give your focus? Okay? Now, it's distracting to me when I see that you're not paying attention to the lesson. If you don't want to be here, don't come at all. But if you want to be here, come and give your focus. That's my request to you. You're not required to be here, but if you come here, let's have it mean that I want to learn today. I want to pay attention to the lesson. Okay. All right. Um, so therefore, we've got two different ways to define the execution time, the CPU execution time of our program. This multiplied by this or this divided by this. And that's just because these are inverses of each other. We know that, don't we? Okay. Any questions about this math here? Okay. So now the, the way to summarize this is what's here at the bottom of the slide. Why don't you read that and think about that? If this gets smaller, this is going to get smaller. That's what we want. Performance will get bigger if the time gets smaller. Or if this gets smaller, this is going to get smaller. Or if this gets bigger, if we raise the clock rate, this is going to get smaller. That's the meaning of that. So that's how to improve the performance of your program. Now let's think a little bit about uh, minimum uh, clock cycle and clock cycle times. The clock rate in megahertz or gigahertz called CR is just the inverse of the clock cycle time. So clock cycle time is 1 over clock rate. Clock rate is 1 over clock cycle time. And so one clock period is the clock cycle time. And the rate is how many per second? Or how many million per second or how many billion per second? So if this is a 10 nanosecond clock period, you know, 10 times 10 to the minus 9th seconds, then 1 over that is going to be uh, 10 to the eighth uh, cycles per second, or 100 mega cycles per second, or 100 megahertz. If this is a five nanosecond clock cycle, we made it smaller, we're going to have a 200 megahertz clock rate. If this is a two nanosecond clock cycle, we made it even smaller, then we're going to have 500 megahertz clock rate. If this is one nanosecond, you know, 10 to the minus ninth seconds, then 10 to the ninth cycles per second is the inverse. We're just doing this. This formula, that's what all these are. They're just doing this calculation right here. Now, I would like you as computer engineers to not have to do that math. I'd like you to know a few of these in your mind, especially this one. This is a very important one. A gigahertz clock rate means a nanosecond clock cycle time. That one should just be one that you remember as part of your common base of knowledge. And from there, if somebody says, hey, I'm running at 5 gigahertz, then you should know that it's going to be 200 picoseconds or a fifth of a nanosecond. Okay, after nanosecond, you know, we get to picosecond. This is 10 to the minus 12th. Okay, so makes sense. If you double the clock rate, you cut the period in half. If you cut the clock rate in half, you double the period. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so here we go all the way from 10 nanoseconds, which is 100 megahertz, all the way up to 5 gigahertz. And of course, if you have some oddball number, you can just plug it into the formula and find it. But these are reasonably easy to calculate by your head if you know this one as a starting point. Okay? You would be amazed how many students cannot do that or even in their head or even with a calculator and give all kind of weird answers. Um, and if your answer is, oh, it's one megahertz, you are way wrong. If your answer is, oh, it's a microsecond clock period, you're way wrong. Okay? I mean, wrong is really wrong in this. Okay? It really matters to get it right. A eh, factor of 10, Boschwer, who cares, is not acceptable. I'm awfully sorry, but you've got to get it right. 
And this is not hard math. This is probably something you could teach an elementary school child. I'm sure you could teach a middle school child this. So Bill Kent University computer engineers, Hafif Ketchme Bundan. Take it seriously and don't make us sad when on the exams and on the quizzes you still continue to get it wrong and you try to graduate from here and still don't know any relationship between clock cycle time and clock period. Please, please, please. Okay, now let's continue. Instead of reporting the execution time in seconds, since we have a fixed clock rate, we often just think about how many cycles it takes to run the program. Because total length of program is total cycles in the program multiplied by the length of a cycle. And we all know the clock rate does not vary. Nobody's got their hand on a dial that says, oh, make it go faster, oh, make it go slower. For the duration of the program, it's going to have a fixed execution rate. So whatever that is, that's a constant. So this becomes the determining factor in how long the program runs. Clock ticks indicate when to start activity. And one uh, way to think of this is one clock period can uh, execute one instruction on modern processors. Clock cycle time is the time between ticks, or how many seconds per cycle. And the clock rate, or frequency, is how many cycles per second. See, seconds per cycle, cycles per second are inverses of each other. So 4 gigahertz clock has 1 over 4 times 10 to the 9th times 10 to the 12th picoseconds, 250 picoseconds cycle time. So if you want to improve performance, you can either make the clock cycle time less, or you can make the number of cycles in a program less. Both of those will result in a faster program. So if you want to improve performance, everything else being equal, you either have to increase or decrease these. Let's see if we can solve this. What do you want to do to the number of required cycles for a program? To improve the performance, do you want to make this increase or decrease? Decrease this, make this smaller, makes this smaller, and making the time smaller makes the performance greater. What about this one, the clock cycle time? Do I want to increase or decrease this? Yeah, clock cycle time is this, the time for a cycle. If I make it smaller, this is smaller, my performance goes up. How about this, the clock rate? Do I want to increase or decrease that? Increase. Yeah, increasing the clock rate will decrease the clock cycle time, and that will cause me to have a faster program. Okay? Now... Back to what we said in the beginning about airplanes, but now it's about computers. One way to look at performance is, here's my job, give it to the computer, when does it pop out? I want to have this be fast, the elapsed time, or what's called sometimes the response time. But a system perspective says, give these to the computer, and per unit of time, how many do we finish? Throughput, that's the throughput view. It's not looking at one job, it's looking at the performance of the whole system, including multiple jobs trying to get through. There's lots of different metrics of performance. Application program level says how many transactions per day or operations per second. Uh, instruction set architecture level says how many millions of instructions per second are running on this, or how many millions of floating point operations per second are running. You should know these terms. MIPS, millions of instructions per second, and megaflops, or sometimes gigaflops, or sometimes teraflops. F-L-O-P-S, floating point operations per second. And I'm going to tell you that floating point operations are slower than integer operations, but you already know that because we just did a chapter on floating point, and you know that some of those are multi-cycle because they take long because they're complicated. You get down in this level, data path control, we're talking about how many megabytes per second can we transfer from memory into the processor. You get down to the transistors and wires, we start asking how many cycles per second, how fast can we switch the circuitry? What's the switching rate of flip-flops and registers? The clock rate. Okay. All right, so CPU clock cycles per program is the number of instructions per program. Well, that's easy to figure out. You look at what you wrote and you follow through how many times the loops execute and you figure out how many instructions the program executed multiplied by the average number of clock cycles per instruction. Cycles per instruction, right? Everybody see that? Instructions per program divided by cycles per instruction. Instructions canceled and what do we have? We have, we have cycles per program. Cycles is numerator left over, program is denominator left over, cycles per program. So the instructions here and the instructions here, because one's numerator and one's denominator, we're going to go through. All right, so that's one way to look at how many cycles there are in a program. And therefore, the execution time can now be thought of as a three-way multiplication. Instructions per program multiplied by cycles per instruction multiplied by clock cycle time, or seconds per cycle. So seconds per cycle cancels, and I have instructions per cycle. And the instructions per program cancels, and I have seconds per program, 
which is exactly what I want. How many seconds does that program take to execute? Okay, any questions about that formula? All right, this formula right here, I'd like to put a box around it and tell you this is one of the big important formulas that you'll use for the rest of the book. And we look at performance, execution time is the inverse of performance, in three terms. How can I make the program execute less instructions? How can I make each instruction use less cycles? How can I make the cycle time be less? How can I make the thing switch faster, okay? Three different factors leading to execution time, which is, as you know, related to performance. Cycles per instruction tells us something about the instruction set architecture, because there can be instructions in our architecture that take a lot of cycles and some that only take a few. And if I have a heavy mix toward long instructions, complicated ones that take a lot of cycles, that's going to boost up this, which is going to make this higher. Hmm? Okay. And the implementation of that architecture and also the program that's measured. This CPI turns out to be a kind of an important factor, and we'll look at it in quite a bit more detail. How many cycles are required for a program? Well, we could assume that the number of cycles equals the number of instructions. Yeah, that's a pretty naive thing to do, but first instruction happens in the first cycle, second instruction happens in the second cycle, third happens in the third cycle. Nice, but too simple, too basic. Because we already know that that's incorrect because we know some things like different instructions take different amounts of time on different machines. We know, for example, that uh, there are machine instructions uh, that execute in more than one cycle and are slower. Think of some of the ones that we've seen, the uh, floating point instructions. We know those don't execute in the same time as the integer instructions. So all machine instructions don't take the number of, same number of cycles. Multiplication takes longer than addition. We saw that addition can be done with one ALU delay. Multiplication is either a state machine or it's got this tree of ALU delays, to, right? So that's clearly going to be multi-cycle. We know that floating point operations take longer than integer ones. And we know that accessing memory is slower than accessing registers. So everything's not the same speed. We know that. Huh. Okay, so therefore some instructions that access memory are going to be slower. If they're floating point, they're going to be slower. If they're certain arithmetic operations, they're going to be slower. So an important point here is changing the cycle time often changes the number of cycles required for various instructions. Now that we understand what a cycle is, uh, we understand that a given program is going to require some number of instructions. That's at the machine level, and obviously not the high level, and some number of cycles and some number of seconds. And we have a vocabulary now that, that relates these together. Cycle time, we've been saying that over and over, is the number of seconds per cycle. Clock rate is the inverse of that, cycles per second. CPI, cycles per instruction. We've been talking about that, the average number of cycles that a given instruction or a group of instructions takes. MIPS, million instructions per second. Okay? That's, this would be higher for a program that used simple instructions, lower for a program that used complicated instructions. So, oops, our graph didn't quite come out right. The time is seconds per program, and that's equal to the product of instructions per program times cycles per instruction times seconds per cycle. These are our big three factors. Put a box around that one, okay? That's the same formula I showed before, but now it's written in uh, the form, well, with, if these were in the right place, form of three fractions multiplied together. Do any of the other variables equal performance? This variable equals performance. You know, how long does it take to run the program? The inverse of performance. Does number of cycles to execute the program equal performance? No, because number of cycles to execute the program is this, and it leaves out that. So it's not the same as time. You could have a high number of cycles, but a really fast clock, and therefore still have a good performing program. No. How about number of instructions in the program? That's this. Does this determine this? Not by itself. That leaves out this. Obviously not. Number of cycles per second. Okay, cycles per second. Um, does that tell us the performance? No, it doesn't. It's part of this. Cycles per second is some kind of a combination of some of these, but no, it doesn't. Uh, average number of cycles per instruction. That's CPI, cycles per instruction. Obviously not. It leaves out those. Average number of instructions per second. No because it's the total seconds that matter, not instructions per second. So none of those themselves are equal to performance. Each of them are sort of part of performance, but the other parts that aren't looked at could make a difference. So a common pitfall is thinking that one of these or something else is actually indicative performance when it really isn't. All right, let's look at CPI and find out that uh, we have two different implementations of an ISA. 
One of them is company A's implementation, one of them is company B. Same ASA, same code is going to run on both. Same number of instructions is going to run on both. For one program, let's say machine A has a clock cycle of 250 picoseconds, and machine B has a clock cycle of 500 picoseconds. Whoa! So this one's running the a clock twice as slow as this one. This one's got a 4 gigahertz clock, this has got a 2 gigahertz clock. Oh, wow, machine B is going to be twice as fast. Wait a minute, the story's not over. Cycles per instruction here is 2.0, cycles per instruction here is 1.2. What does it mean? To run an instruction, it takes two clock cycles. To run an instruction here, it only takes 1.2 clock cycles. <coughs> so this one seems to be executing um, at a slower rate, but the instructions execute a lot more quickly. This one executes at a higher rate, but the instructions execute more slowly. So, which machine is faster for this program? Well, wait a minute. Hoja, you didn't tell us about the third factor. The third factor was instructions per program. Well, the answer to that is, since it's the same ISA, the instructions per program is going to be the same. In other words, you take a program in a high-level language, you compile it and you turn it into a machine language, it's going to be the same because the target architecture was the same. So there's no difference. Fixed times CPI of A times clock rate of A, or cycles per second. Fixed times CPI of B times clock cycle time of B. That's the clear thing. So we have to therefore multiply this times this, and that is obviously 500, and multiply this times this, and that's obviously 600. Which one's bigger? This one is bigger better, or is bigger worse? Bigger's worse. All right, so this one ends up being faster, and is it faster by twice as much? No, because clock rate alone doesn't tell the story. How much is it faster by? 600 divide 500, right, which is 1.2. It's 1.2 times faster. Not twice as fast, 1.2 times faster. Okay, great. That was our first little uh, thing here. Now, um, if two machines have the si same ISA, which of our quantities will always be the same? Will clock rate always be the same if they have the same ISA? Oh, obviously not. Two different manufacturers implemented it completely differently. Will they have the same CPI? No, obviously not. Two different manufacturers implemented it differently, had different CPIs. Will they have the same execution time? Obviously not. We just said this one's going to execute 1.2 times faster than this one. No, they won't. Will they have the same number of instructions? Yes, because they have the same ISA. They'll have the same number of instructions in the program. Will they have the same number of instructions per second? No, because we said instructions is the same, but execution time is different, and therefore they won't have the same instructions per second or million instructions per second, so those are different. The only thing that's the same if ISA is the same is the number of instructions, because the target architecture is the same. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. All right. All right. Well, this is that same example. Let's just go through it real quick. For each computer executes the same number of instructions. Let I denote that number of instructions. So the clock cycle for machine uh, A is I times 2, and the CPU clock cycles, not cycle time, but number of cycles is instructions times CPI, instructions times CPI. The total time is cycles times the clock cycle time, Yanni, this times this times uh, this, or this times this times uh, that time, and we end up with 500 and 600 times I times PS. So computer A is faster, and it's faster by 600 over 500, which is 1.2. We already did that, but you can see that in that slide there. All right, and so one more time, our basic performance equation is instruction count, number of instructions, times cycles per instruction on average, times the clock cycle time. And if you want to change that, you can put it as clock rate. So this times this, either multiplied by this or divided by that. That's the thing that I want you to leave this first lesson from, is remembering. Performance is this the opposite or the inverse of time. If you want high performance, you need low time. To get low time, there's three factors. Make the number of instructions that you execute low. That means good algorithm, good language, good optimizing, compiling, right? All those things. Secondly, have the number of cycles that those instructions need to be low. That's got to do with the instruction set architecture. And thirdly, have the clock cycle time be as short as you can. Execute those cycles as fast as you can. The three of those will lead to a low product, which is time. Low time gives high performance. 
That's the summary of this first hour's lesson. Now you go read in chapter one the material and the examples that I didn't show, follow through the slides, and come back on uh, Friday ready to do some more in this stuff. Okay, we're going to have a lot of problems based on this. I'm going to give you a little, little advanced clue here. Performance and performance analysis is pregnant, pregnant with great opportunities for exam problems, homework problems, quiz problems, okay? So if you would like to have a low grade in this class, I encourage you very strongly to ignore this whole business, forget it, you know, silly uh, you'll get a great low grade. If you'd like to have a high grade in this class, Tom Terrace, I encourage you to study this material, put focus on it, try to make sure that you can understand it. All of it is algebra. There's no calculus here or higher math. It's all just algebra, so any middle school student can do this mathematically, but not any middle school student can understand the concepts. Concepts are computer concepts. That's why we're teaching it to you, computer engineers. Okay, go out and have a nice rest of the week, and I'll see you on Friday. Okay?